she said to me, she was like, don't you think these pros get a bit tired of playing the same course all the time? Like, don't you think like the you know they'd be like, nah, I've played Augusta loads of times. No, I don't, I don't fancy it anymore. Yeah, I'll swear a bit next year. Completed it, mate. I'm actually <laughs> going to Skegness for the weekend to try it at a different place instead. They get the invite in that sort of like that lovely envelope from Fred, what's his name, who's the head of master, you know, that and, yeah. and they open it up, they're like, Dear Fred, I'm sorry to tell you, but I'm actually gonna decline your invitation. Can't make it. I've played Augusta so many times, I'm just a bit bored of it now. Hi, and welcome back to the latest episode of the Golf Yourself Healthy podcast. The podcast where deep, meaningful, and philosophical conversations about golf and life are par for the course. I'm your host, Chris Lynch. I'd like to say this to you, to our GYH community members, all of us who remember are unified by the belief that golf is good for us. I'd like to firstly, before I get into introducing today's episode, is just ask you again, if you are a repeat listener to this podcast, you know what it's all about, you're enjoying it, then please leave us a review on your podcast platform of choice. It shouldn't take more than just a few seconds of your time. If you can leave us a five-star review, if you think that review is warranted, and also even better still, leave us a comment just so we understand what you're enjoying about the podcast, what we're doing well, what we could be doing better and any ideas that you have for future episodes. And actually, if you prefer, in addition to or alternatively to leaving a review, you can get in touch with me, chris at golfyourselfhealthy.com. Do check out our website, golfyourselfhealthy.com, because all the resources, all of our back catalogue of podcasts, journal articles, and my contact details are available there. So check all of that out. Now to today's podcast episode, episode eight, Golf Buddies Allowed. For today's episode, I have invited back my good friend, Ben Seabrook, who, if you're a repeat listener, a regular listener, or even if you're a new listener, then I will tell you that Ben was my first guest on the Golf Yourself Healthy podcast, going back to episode two, Golf in Solitary Confinement. And couple of reasons why I've invited Ben back to be on today's podcast. One, the conversation that Ben and I had in that episode has proven to be one of the most popular and most downloaded episodes of the Golf Yourself Healthy podcast so far. And reflecting on the comments and the feedback I've had, it has led me to believe that that is clearly one of the most relatable episodes that we have put out so far. And I thought it'd be great to bring Ben back for an opportunity for me to, in a very relaxed environment, to shoot the breeze and to reflect on the journey that we have been on at Golf Yourself Healthy so far, the direction that Golf Yourself Healthy is going in. Also an opportunity for Ben and I to share with you a really exciting announcement about a golf challenge that he and I and our friend Mike Harris will be doing in June. So make sure you listen out listen to the full episode and we'll share more details about that golf challenge coming up in June and how you can support us with that. That's really about it. I don't want to give you chapter and verse and all the different things and the cool stuff that you're going to hear about in today's podcast episode. Let's head straight over into the conversation. Back by popular demand, I am delighted to say that I am joined by none other than than Ben Seabrook. Ben, who joined us in, in episode two for Golf in solitary confinement. Ben, welcome back. Thank you. How you doing? Good, thank you. Yeah, doesn't feel like it was all that long ago that we were sat recording that first or the second episode. It's been good. I've enjoyed listening to the, the one subsequent to to that one as well. They've been really interesting conversations. Yeah, well, thanks. Certainly, part of this conversation, I want to use the opportunity to to have you share your reflections on, you know, because you've you've listened to just about all of them, I think. Mm-hmm so far since since the one that you featured in and I guess you know so no pressure but certainly you you, the episode with you and I ranks up there with one of the most popular ones that we've had so far I I do have a theory that it's actually the Man City fans that are actually just (laughs) (laughs) surely they uh, would have review bombed it if they'd they'd been this thing (laughs) yeah exactly uh, not having the successful reviews that you've had in all seriousness though I think 
there's a theme that I'm 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 reading and hearing that's coming out in in the reviews or in comments that I'm getting from from listeners or friends or family who are listening to the podcast, which is it's very relatable. And I think that was especially the the case with the episode that you and I did together. I think people really valued the and could tell there was a familiarity between between the two of us. So so yeah, you know, just Certainly, as far as the listener is concerned, the intention now that we're, I mean, I think in reality, by the time this this particular episode goes out, it's going to be probably around episode eight, you know, and by the time this one goes out, folks will have had the chance to listen to our latest episode with Dr. Zach Gould, who is trying, bless his heart, to get me into some degree of shape fitness. He's a golf fitness coach, Ben, and I think he's yeah. possibly already losing the will to live and trying to <laughs> whip me into shape, to be perfectly honest. But we talked a little bit about that, but also talked about some, I mean, if you consider the people that we've had on the pod so far, I would, with the greatest respect to everyone, including yourself, that's been on the podcast, call it your everyday average golfer. Whereas in Zach's case, this is a guy who performed at the highest level until the age of about 20, played on the Junior Ryder Cup team with Rory McIlroy. And so his, what's really interesting with him is, I think, you know, given that we're all about golf being good for you here, mm-hmm. golf yourself healthy, I think he, his, his take on that is one that I've been really wanting to explore with someone who what well, he was an amateur golfer and part of his story is he didn't make it professional and he still got the scars to you know it's obviously really affected him but I just loved hearing his perspective on you know whereas for most of us ordinary golfers we say you know golf is good for our physical and mental health and whatever else it's kind of he was talking about how he can't really switch off the performance element you know he's sure you know, so that was an interesting one. I think that will be interesting as well, though, because I think if I think back to how the recordings have gone so far, or the, the people you've spoken to so far, the main focus has been on the mental side of it and how it helps us mentally. Yes, it helps us physically as well, right? But yeah, we're only playing really, really speaking, I imagine, other than Alex, who's playing golf, seen all over the world. Mm. regularly right most of us are playing once maybe twice a week in the summer so there's the physical benefits of doing that regular exercise sure but i think a lot of the conversations are focused on how it's helped us deal with grief or you know how it's helped us deal with or feel like you're helping others deal with the situations there in like the chapter where else to play the place up in yorkshire and that oh yeah rodding park yeah anthony blackburn golfing society yeah but it'll be, yeah, it'll be interesting to get the slant on the kind of the physical benefits of playing golf, but also preparing to play golf. I think that would be like quite an interesting thing to hear. Well, something you've just said there probably leads me straight into something I really wanted to share on this podcast, which is something I'm I'm sensing in pe- things that people say to me, or especially where I've been approaching certain people to, to guest on the podcast in future, or even in Zach's case, like he was at pains to say, you know, I, I've not lost anyone dear to me. And, you know, I, I, I did intentionally when launching Golf Yourself Healthy want to start out with this theme around golf yourself through grief. But mm-hmm. I do, I do I, you know, I'm, I'm mindful of not kind of I, I don't want this to be a niche podcast around it's just people sure. that come on that talk about people that have died Lost and stuff yeah, yeah, you know, yeah and why they golf because and and that look that's very much that's part of my story I guess it's part of your story too but it, what the reason I'm the reason I'm bringing this up is because like I say the, the belief that golf is good for you can look and sound like many different things it can have lots of different stories behind it and I've just sensed almost like a reluctance from certain people to maybe come on to the podcast, either because actually they're, the thought of being vulnerable and opening up maybe is quite scary. Uncomfortable, in a way. yeah. Uncomfortable. uncomfortable bit, right? But also, you know, I mean, I'm interested in your take on that, you know, is it, because I guess we've, we've had, that's been the majority of, in the most part, barring, actually barring Alex and Zach. So we've kind of naturally transitioned in a different direction in the last couple of episodes but you know almost where where would you love to see this go yeah i i i I often had conversations with brian my wife about 
about this type of thing, right? Because she would often get really frustrated with people seemingly complaining about what seemed to us to be quite trivial things uh, with her view of, um, you know, it can be much worse. Believe me, we know it can be, you know, I, I would say we probably feel that it's as bad as it can get if you lose a child, right? It's, it doesn't get much worse than that, I would have thought. But what I keep having to tell her is that grief and things like that, they're relative, right? You deal with the situation that's in front of you. If you've never had to deal with loss of a loved one or things like that, that doesn't mean that your grief for something else is any less valid than the grief that we have. So I think, I don't think it should be about grief as such. It's about making sure that when you have people have tough times, because they always have tough times, regardless of the situation, there'll always be tough times. Someone might be going through a divorce. Someone might be going through loss of a job. You know, there's all this different stuff that actually having that gold thing there can help them to deal with that and process that side of things. Mm. So I don't think it does need to go into that niche space. I think there are other ways in which people... So I, the one thing I would say is if, if people are listening to this and they've got stories of how golf has helped them through anything, it doesn't need to be difficult times, anything, you know, have they met their other halves on the golf course, whatever it might be, you know, mm. whatever those stories are, people want to hear those things because that those are the things that are relatable. All right, maybe not me and your other half of the golf club, golf course. I don't suppose that happens too often, although it did happen with the lady who wrote the book in the States. Yeah, Robin Chodak. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm sure she said that she met her husband at the golf course or, you know, he was a key golfer either way. Yeah, she did. Yeah. So there are loads of different stories and angles that golf can influence people in, you know, how much, like I, I used to think, well, obviously our sort of shared background is that we both used to work in recruitment. And I would say, I did most of my business in my area on a golf course, more often than not. Probably doesn't happen so much now. Recruitment's changed these days, right? That's a, it's a little bit more of a corporate thing. Less, less cowboys, more corporate. But <laughs> having some of those experiences off the back of my job is incredible, right? It's a, it's a really cool thing. I've got some really fun stories, to, you know, to, to, to say about work, golf trips, and things like that. So there's loads of different angles that people can come at this from. It doesn't necessarily need to be about dealing with depression or dealing with grief or dealing with loss or any of that sort of stuff. It can just be about how good golf makes you feel. Yeah, completely. So yeah, I'd say get anyone and everyone involved if they can. Yeah, I mean, a couple of things. So it's funny you talk about our background in recruitment and I look back and certainly in my early years of working a recruitment agency, I I, I never got the invite for the golf days because I was just that bad at golf at the time. <laughs> so, but I, I, I think I've, I've worked hard, at, you know, I've, I've got to a standard now where I maybe do get a look in, but, <laughs> but the other, so just to recap, it is not necessary that someone that you love has died to come on this podcast and tell your story. <laughs> but, you know, again, in all seriousness, like I just, I want to sort of dispel the myth almost, but, yeah. you know, I was, I was speaking to a guy the other day who, who I became friends with last year when I've, I've briefly mentioned, well, not briefly to you, I've talked to you in, in length and briefly mentioned in this podcast that I served on the board at my local golf club last year and, and he and I were on the board together and we are no longer on the board together and we've kind of got, you know, we've got the war stories and the scars to, to show for it. But he was, you know, he was, for example, encouraging me to, to sort of, you know, kind of keep keep things, you know, light or, you know, but not, not be to, to, to be too heavy as well. And I think, and I think he's he's saying that from a from a place of, you know, he's got traumatic life experiences like you and I have, and I'm not I'm not going to mm. go into that here now. It's not my place to do that. But I think the I guess the the headline here actually is putting my oxygen mask on throughout this period because I'm still grieving the loss of my son, and talking about him on this podcast is healing. But at the same time, I think something that's come up for me in the in the early stages of doing this podcast and writing my journal articles, trying to build a following in social media is an obsession with the process and actually obsessing about getting more followers, getting more reviews. And that's just in my nature, you know, and, and I think I'm the sort of person that goes all in on things. But so I'm trying to give myself grace and enjoy this, this time off from, from my full-time job as well. I think it's also important to think about the fact that this has a, a, there's an opportunity to 
enjoy this rather than using it as your therapy. I'm not suggesting you are using it as therapy, but it is yeah. helping you to come to terms with what happened. But yeah. the with life, life isn't like a flat road the whole way along, is it? There's loads of highs, there's loads of lows, and sometimes the, the highs and lows are happening at the same time. You know, it's it's a really sounds a bit like golf, and yeah, yeah, it is, isn't it? Because you can go from yeah. hitting an absolute bomb of a drive to then duffing the next two approach shots in. Yeah. So I think you just got to enjoy it as much as you can and lean into the the grief when you're having those days where you feel shit and yeah, don't feel guilty in the days where you're you're not feeling so shit, which is difficult because you know it's yeah like feeling like you're all right for a day when people would say how can you feel all right with what's happened all that kind of stuff is it's a difficult thing to do but if you're not oh yeah i don't know it's just like i just i feel like there's an opportunity for growth both yeah to deal with what you've dealt with but also to grow as an individual use of using the impacts of everything that's happened to you good and bad to grow as a person and i think the more you talk to a variety of different people and learn about their stories the bigger or the broader your horizons are the more you grow yeah for sure what we are doing here right now ben is where i where i partly got this idea for us so you know this is the second episode that we're doing together and i mm. i intend and we've talked about doing this more often i think that I think my my loose intention at the moment is we continue to have guests coming on in the same way that we have in all the episodes up to now, but you and I have like a regular check-in almost like once or twice a month or something and use the opportunity to mm -hmm. reflect on what's been going on in, in our lives, in our golf, in Golf Yourself Healthy. And actually, I kind of have taken the inspiration for this format that you and I are doing now and actually that some of the what well, some of the inspiration for golf yourself healthy has come from drew bradford and connor over at group golf therapy so i'm going to give them a shout out now because when when i came up with this idea for golf yourself healthy and did the research and I, as i said my opening pod there's not many others out there doing this like sort of talking talking about golf in this way and, and those three guys were like we're doing now, we're just friends coming on together and just shooting the breeze about golf and life. So mm -hmm. this can go wherever we want it to go. And I'll use this opportunity. I mean, I said a moment ago about obsessing about reviews and follows. So please, if you're listening, leave a review and follow on social media for the sake of my fragile ego. Thank you very much. <laughs> and mine. <laughs> and yours as well. Yeah. And mine, and mine. Yeah. So, I mean, what's been going on for you these last few weeks? Well, as far as my golf game goes, very up and down. So there's a couple of really positive things coming out. So I, I think I mentioned in the podcast we did that Jensen was about to join mm. my golf club. He's now been to a, a fully fledged member since the beginning of May, but I started having his lessons at the end of April. So he's now had three. They're group lessons. So there's, I think there's about 15 or so of them in his group and he's done Putting one week, been in the driving range another week, and then was doing chipping last week. Very much enjoying it, although he did get a whack on the head with a golf club because he was stood a bit too close to one of the other kids on Saturday last week, which is a bit of a shame. But he was fine. He he was um, happy as Larry. But he's re he's been really enjoying it. It's really nice because the lessons are at four and they run till five. So in the first week, Brian and I both went and then we stayed for a bit of dinner afterwards. And then he was... Adam that he wanted to go back out on the button green back to the driving range after we'd had dinner. So he had an hour of golf before, then we had something to eat, and then we had another hour of golf, just the two of us knocking balls in the driving range and all that kind of stuff. And then similarly, last, not this Saturday, just gone because we had, we had to get back, but the Saturday before it was the same. You know, he was, he did the driving range and then he was like, okay, daddy, when we finish, is it all right if we go back out on the chipping green and all that kind of stuff? So we had another half an hour just chipping balls around and stuff like that. So that's kind of been really, nice for me to feel like he's not just doing it for the bare minimum amount of time and then wanting to come home like he's enjoying being around the club he's enjoying you know he's chatting to some of the other kids in the in the group and all that so he's starting to you know sort of interact and all of that kind of thing and uh, it's it's been a really strange process for me because brian and i obviously are concerned about the fact he's an only child we've mm. decided we're not having any more i think we said that before I often worry about him missing out on the sort of things that I did when I was a kid, right? Because when I was a kid, we'd get home from school, you'd chain your bag down and you'd go straight back out again, sit around your mate's house or whatever. He doesn't seem, he doesn't do that. 
and he's quite happy being at home. And so we worry about it a little bit. And then we speak to some of the other parents at school. And it, I think it's just a generational thing. Like They're like, no, our kids don't do that either. They don't go out around each other's houses all the time and things like that. So we do worry about that sort of stuff. So him doing clubs, like he does music at school. He's in a, he's in a school band thing where he plays drums at school. And if I can get him enjoying his golf and then send him off to the, go down to the golf club and send him off with some of his mates to go and play on the academy course, or whatever, that's what mm. I want to, that's where he's going to get his social interaction. That's where he's going to build his friendship groups from, I think. So, so yeah, that's been, that's been good. As for my own personal game, I went down and played one evening a couple of weeks ago. I bumped into a friend of mine and played, he played the front nine with me and then I played um, the back nine on my own. And I shot 42 points with a blob of 15, which is my handicap at the moment. So I was very pleased with that. And then played Wednesday last week and probably got, four points for the 18 holes I've played. I was terrible, game. absolutely dreadful. So yeah, that's where my game's at at the moment. Never know what you're getting. I think one week to the next. Yeah. How about you? How's your game? Have you been able to play much? Actually a lot more than usual. I think what's, what's quite cool is, yeah, it's kind of with doing golf yourself healthy, it's obviously given me this kind of and with the time off I've got from work as well, it's going to give me a bit of a new mm-hmm. lease of life and you know, I've got more time than I usually would to to play. And it's funny in a way, because actually, I think I'm almost feeling obliged to play more because I'm doing golf yourself healthy, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, sometimes it can give you the drive to go out and then other times it can feel like a chore at times, I suppose. Does it feel like a chore or not? No, it it, it doesn't. I think what I would say is, I, again, it's it's I'm trying to give myself grace if that's the right expression because it, it, I mean yes it's, it's it's you know I said it in that recent podcast uh, with the start of the one with, with Zach that I was talking about before which is that yeah we believe that golf is good for you and golf yourself healthy but I mean I'd be the first to admit that it can be very frustrating sometimes but yeah. it's funny how it goes like I mean just to give you a few examples I just played a one club challenge at Cleve Hill. Oh, they do the Cleve Hill thing? Yeah, with, with Alex. Alex put some stuff up and there. I follow another guy called Ginge Golf, I think, or something like that. He plays quite a top 100 courses, I think, as well, doesn't he? And he played in as well, I think. Yeah. How was it? What did you? What club did you use? It was a six iron. I went with a okay. six iron. Okay. Did you get any, any bunkers? I didn't. I actually avoided the bunkers incredibly. Well done. <laughs> no way you're getting out of one of them with a six iron. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, going, if you haven't listened already, you, you you need to go back and listen to episode six with Alex Frolish uh, of Elevation Golfing Nation fame. And he's a a member and a real stalwart and, and respected figure, I guess I would say, up at, up at Cleve Hill. And, you know, he put on this one club challenge, which was themed around, well, it's kind of paying homage to old Tom, old Tom Morris, Morris, the course yeah. architect. And the winner, the guy who won shot a gross 76 with a seven iron. I, I just incredible. And he was in the group in front of him. What was he playing off? I don't know what his handicap was actually, but I mean, that's, that's, in, that's very, very, very impressive yeah, yeah. to both, you know, the fully initiated golfer listing and the uninitiated golfer that that's incredibly impressive. But no, what, I mean, so for instance, like by virtue of the fact that it was a one club challenge, I think it demands that you don't take yourself too seriously because you can't, especially when you're a like 19, 20 handicapper like me, who can be prone to hacking at the best of times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. You can't walk up with any real expectations that you're going to. So I shot 21 point in a stable okay. card. That's not bad. One bloody club. That's pretty. No, it's not bad. <laughs> I've got to say, I've got another quote for you there. I've got a quote for you, it's, and it's relevant to what you're saying as well. Okay. So this was from another lady called Amy Olcott. She's another professional golfer on the ladies' tour, long since retired. I think her quote is: "Keep your sense of humour. There's enough stress in the rest of your life not to let bad shots ruin a game you're supposed to enjoy." So I think it's always something that's probably worth sticking in the back of your mind. Whenever you do start to feel the rage bubbling up, frustration bubbling up. Definitely. And by the end of that round, I, I'd say I was in pretty good spirits, despite the fact that like, I naturally wished I'd played that little bit better and had a better score or whatever. But 
I knocked in a one putt for a par with the six iron on the 18th hole. Oh, yes. And that, that I was like, I'm coming back next week. You know, yeah, that's yeah, that yeah. one yeah. shot that, and that's what I mean. Like it can be a frustrating game, but it's, it's good for you in many ways. But for me, it's amongst the ways in which it's good for me are when that moment appears, which is like the golfing gods have just said, okay, Chris, I'm going to, the last shot I hit, the, the 106th. We'll give you one. We'll throw you a bow. We'll throw you a bow over there. Yeah, man. Go on. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Keep, keep you coming back for more. But I mean, to your, to your question, I mean, I've got quite a few things written down here. Like I've got a few golfing stories or anecdotes that I want to, I want to share because yeah, it's been a really quite busy few weeks and months or so for me, both on and off the golf course. I mean, my wife, Kim and I went to Mexico for a couple of weeks for mm friend's wedding and while we were there so that was in Riviera Maya which is quite close to Cancun and I played at Mayacoba which is top ranked course in Mexico it's a resort course it used to be a PGA tour course is it not still I thought it was no it's a live golf yeah it was a live golf one yeah yeah it's fun because I know they played there a few weeks a couple months back didn't I think in February yeah and so all the signage was still up I thought what was quite interesting in that respect was you walk in there and barring one photograph I saw of Victor Hovland, who plays on the PGA Tour and had won there, I think Mm. the last time the PGA Tour was there, you would not know it was ever a PGA Tour venue. It was just splashed with live everywhere. And I just... I find that intriguing that there's no space for both of them. You know, it's like, it's like you're either, you're either us or you're them. Not yet. Not yet. We'll see what happens with that in the longer term, I suppose. I did see a thing today that suggests that, so then Rory come out and said he didn't want to be on the players council for the PGA tour anymore. So there's too yeah. much bad blood between what happened with the Jay Monaghan situation. Yeah. I mean, I, so this is, you're saying Rory McIlroy talked about going back on the PGA Tour policy board. The policy board, that was it. Yeah, I mean, like I, I was thinking about this before we went went on air with this and I, I keep, I go back to what I said at the, the my first podcast episode, which was I, I don't want to del- delve too much into the pr- professional m- game because I think I'm a bit, personally, I'm a bit, well, first of all, I don't, I don't think. Are you done with it? I'm kind of, I'm done with it. I yeah, I can, I, I kind of am. I think I, I, I'm feeling quite apathetic towards it now, just because, you know, I think. So I'm actually going to use this opportunity now to give a bit of a plug to the latest article that I wrote, the journal article, which is around growing the game and and why we're growing the game. And you know, I, I just don't like that expression really being used in the context of the professional game. I just don't. I, I more believe in. How much more does it need to grow? That's so much money involved in the game anyway. Well, that's 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 right. But I mean anyway, I, I think going back to, to Mayakoba, what what so did I enjoy my playing experience there? I think I enjoyed the opportunity to take that course off. And I'm It was windy though, wasn't it, when you were there? Very, yeah. So yeah. it's what about thirty mile an hour winds, thirty five mile an hour winds. No, sorry, that was a temperature. What I'm talking about is like thirty five degrees Celsius or something like that in just high winds, it was like playing Lynx golf in boiling hot conditions. And, <laughs> you know, Lynx golf in wind is hard enough. And then when you're, 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 you're roasting hot as well, it's, but I guess it just, and actually I was going to ask you for your, your view on this, because you've got experience of playing, you know, really quite prestigious courses in the U S for example, which commandeer quite pricey green fees, for instance. And I guess my feeling coming away from Mayakoba was, you know, for instance, Kim came out in the course with me. My wife, Kim, is an architect. She found it, she was marveling at the fact that, that it's a bit of an architectural feat because it's built into mangroves, for example. So the way in which they've built it is, is quite sympathetic to, to its natural environment that's around it and things. And, but, but I guess it's a heavily manicured golf course. Mm. It's expensive to play there. It's set up for tourists, I would say, in the most part. And it just, it, for me, it just had that kind of feeling that although you, you get well looked after when you're there. It's a resort course, right? It's not a member's course. No, it's that, exactly that. But I guess what, what I'm driving at here is I'm realizing more and more that my something I particularly 
my greatest enjoyment that I get out of playing on a particular golf course is the surroundings that it has around it, the, the feel that the place has, you know, like I like to lose myself and I, I love millionaires golf. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. Craddock, the, the, that I mem- mentioned that I was a member at and was on the board of, like it's, it's set in the Brecon beacons. It's got beautiful natural surroundings and like you can go there of an evening and no one else is on the golf course. It's really quiet, you know, and it just, I guess I felt like I was <laughs> It sounds ridiculous, but it was almost like an Orion Air flight where it's like you're getting pumped through the system and it's like, right, you kind of come out the 18th and then you're on to, they're going to load the next load of people onto the first tee or whatever. And, and so what I'm trying to say is I walked off feeling satisfied that I played it and had the opportunity to, but for instance, I don't, you know, I, I get I get a lot more actually out of playing at somewhere like Cleve Hill, which is in the Cotswolds. It's on the top of this hill, and it's just it's like otherworldly, you know. So, I mean, what's maybe you? I don't know. How do you? Yeah, I, like I never. So we, uh, as you like, we played at Kiowa Island last year, and we played three courses there. Two of them were well, one of them was no, two of them were effectively like parkland, right? So Kiowa Island as an island is big. It's a big. Resort. It weirdly, it's a lot like like a posh set of pubs, is how I would describe it, because they have lots of. It's like a holiday. There's there's houses there where people obviously live, and there's some mega mega houses there. I think Dan Marino lives there. You know the old uh, Dolphins quarterback. He's got a house there. So a f- few people that live on that resort. Right. But ultimately, there's you know there, I think there's five or six golf courses there, and then there's the chalets that people rent to holiday with. So you hop you rent from the Kiwa Resort and then you stay in these chalets and there's bikes there that take you to the centre and there's shops and all of that kind of stuff in the centre of the centre. And it weirdly, it felt to me like we were being pushed through that sausage factory on the first course we played, which is one of the Parkland courses, which it wasn't a, a p- playing at a particularly fast pace, but you did feel a little bit like you were just being sort of shoved out. We then played the Ocean Course, which is the toughest course in the States. I think it's, you know, it's slope rating is basically, I think it's the toughest golf course in, uh, in America. And it was busy, but not, not really busy. We had great weather for it. It wasn't too windy. I didn't play great, but it was a, it was a hell of an experience to go around somewhere like that. And again, like you, um, you know, like Kim was saying, it's very, it, the way in which that ocean course is built at Kiwa is very sympathetic to how the, the land is, you know, it's right on the, the seafront, as you can imagine. You've got two loops of like it's like a figure eight. So you go out, play four or five holes, and come back four, and then do four the other way. Weirdly, it reminded me a little bit of there's a place in Norfolk near me called Brancaster, and the golf course there's called Royal West Norfolk, which is quite a, it's quite difficult. I don't actually I don't know if it is that difficult to get on, but it's it's difficult to become a member there. Let's just put it that way. It's right. there's a long waiting list to be a member. It's quite high signing on fee, and then the fees are. It's a it's a prestigious place to play. That, for example, they only let you play two balls. You can't play any more than a two ball. So you can play foursomes, but you can't play a four ball or a three ball. And they have a loop out of nine and a loop back, but it's all in the dunes. So again, it's very sympathetic. And actually, there, depending on whether the tide's in or not, the course completely changes. So the channels fill up, and like big parts of the course, you're then hitting two hundred and twenty yards over water, and the tide's in. And when your tide's out, there's no wall for you to clear at all. And actually, Kiwa felt a little bit like that kind of lynx, very lynxy, dunesy type thing. But we didn't feel like we were under massive pressure behind us. And there was no one that went out in front of us either. So we weren't even like having to keep up with the group in front of us. We played all right golf, so we weren't playing slowly. I think we were around in sort of four and a half hours, maybe a little bit longer, but it wasn't too bad. I mean, the one thing I would say is slightly different with Kiwa Island and Royal West Norfolk because there were crocodiles on <laughs> Kira Island or Alligators, I can't remember which one it was. One of them was a big one. And then I just remember walking down the, the fairway and the caddy that we had with us pointed this one out that was just sunbathing on the side of this lake. And there were a few balls scattered around him where obviously people had hit that ball and he'd been there a while and they just left the ball there. And he started <laughs> lobbing balls at the thing to try and hit the crocodile, see if it would move. <laughs> it was just insane. I tell you that it sounds like that crocodile could make a tidy little side hustle on eBay with Pro V ones. Then, <laughs> absolutely, yeah, absolutely. You know, it was strange because, and maybe it's because it was that bit more expensive to play that course than the sausage factory one. 
because that was like a, a the, the first one we played was a, a far easier parkland course where it was much more in the center of where everything was so it, may, maybe that's just because it's cheaper for people to play that one and then go on their rounds there but then we played another parkland course before we left there the cougar point it was which was absolutely beautiful it was such a stunning course a lot of water so a lot of lakes and things like that around rivers and stuff and like the par threes, for example, there were four par threes and they were all completely different. So one of them you were playing over reeds to quite a wide green and, and water. Another one was surrounded by sand. Another one was like a almost like an island green. Mm. I can't remember what the, the last one was. But again, we didn't really feel, despite the fact when we got there, the, the starter was a miserable sod. Once we got going, we didn't really feel like we were under any pressure and you were able to really take in the environment. And I think that's what I want to do. And I feel that's probably what you wanted to do and you were frustrated with the fact that you were having to sort of chug along and not really sit and absorb the environment. You were potentially in and enjoying, I think, maybe. Well, do you know what, actually? You, so, well, just to, to conclude on what you were saying there then. So, for ex- for instance, like the likes of Kiowa Island or these, these nice courses that you played, of these been it's it, it's been because you've done these kind of us open no was that you what? masters the us open we're going to 2026 so so your reason that's right sorry yeah you're yeah. going to the us open 2026 and your reasoning for playing those courses so happened to be that it's like a when in rome thing like you're you're there for the master yeah pretty much yeah we went there so we, we'd originally when we put the master's trip i i paid for my part of it as a 40th birthday present to myself but the main reason we were going is that my friend Scott's 50th, so he wanted to go to the Masters for his 50th birthday. And we'd originally had tickets for the Saturday and the Sunday, but we decided that we would trade the Saturday ticket for the trip to Kira Island. Okay. So we had originally planned to go for five days, for uh, four nights, just to go into Augusta and then fly back out again when it had finished on the Monday. But we sort of said, well, while we're there, shouldn't we try and play a bit of golf? And the company that we booked with just basically said, look, well, you know, if you don't take the Saturday ticket, the cost of that Saturday ticket would pay for you to go and have two nights and three rounds of golf in Kiowa. Okay. So we were like, yeah, well, let's, let's do that. I mean, it elongated the trip a little bit, but yeah, it was a hell of a, hell of a trip. Yeah. And I, I think so you, you, a few things you said have, have kind of prompted me to sort of keep myself honest here. So for instance, given what you pay my Cobra, I was actually very pleasantly surprised to find that when I turned up there, having booked myself Dino Z one ball, mm. that I was convinced that they were going to fill the tee sheet and put me with three randoms, but they actually didn't. And I think that's great because they, they very easily could and they could really yeah, milk yeah. it for all they want. So to me, that suggests that they are receptive to, you know, they, they want to give the, the customer the experience that they want. And it's not a sausage factory in in that respect. And and actually, but one thing that was quite funny was, so you know, I I have, again I have to sort of keep myself honest, and you know, I I talk about golf yourself healthy being about making you know golf being accessible and not taking itself or taking myself too seriously in a golf course, mm. and. <laughs> Kim had to keep sort of reminded me just to chill out a little bit because there was a you were like, in Mexico. <laughs> well, yeah. well, yeah, you know we're on we're on holiday, we're having fun yeah. or whatever. So, like, so for instance, I'd started off quite well, playing the first three or four holes quite well, got to like a par four, I don't know what it was a fifth hole or something, seven off the tee because basically the wind was just so strong and took everything left to right. <laughs> you know, I'm like. Kim was in charge of content that day. You know, she was going to record a few little bits of video or whatever that, <laughs> we'll that haven't made it to socials <laughs> because I, I just was in too much of a bad mood. But it was just like, you know, do, do you want to talk me through that one, Chris? I was like, I absolutely do not want to talk you through. <laughs> you know, so but then also there was there was a guy in front of us with his partner who I have to admit was taking a long time, just kind of like, but so on the, on the 18th green, by the, by the time I'm fried, I just want to get in for some lunch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I've had a tough round out there. I've enjoyed it. You know, he's on the green with his his partner taking selfies with the flag stick out and stuff like that. And I'm just like, you know, 
Come on, mate. Yeah. So, some etiquette. Show some etiquette here. Mate. <laughs> I've got, yeah, show some etiquette. Show some respect. I've got a 220 yard shot. I'm going to fat here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I've got a 220 yard approach shot, which I'm definitely not going to make the green with, but I'm going to stand yeah. here. And- I'm going to stand here and teapot in the fairway all the same, you know, and it, and this is what I mean. Like I think golf snobbery and elitism and it, it can be very cunning and it can, it can, I have to catch myself sometimes, you know? Yeah. I, I don't know if I would say that's snobbery. I think that's about having awareness of your surroundings, right? And it's being considerate of the other golfers that are on the course. So yeah, I, I think we're, if you can see that someone is struggling with their golf, and you're putting undue pressure on them. I think that is a, that is poor form. If you've got if you've got somebody who's clearly you know faffing around and is holding up people behind them, that is also poor form. So I I don't have any issue of calling people out. He he was a perfectly competent golfer from what I could tell. Like you know I saw him hit some nice shots. And actually you know to my point around how the course wasn't necessarily all that busy that day, and he had time to you know. Yeah, okay, like you could argue he could have been a bit more respectful to the fact that I was up his Wiley. backside yeah, yeah. and waiting most a lot of the time. But then it got me to thinking, well, look, you know, again, he's on holiday, much like I am. Yeah, but he could have simply said, right, if he realised that you were right up his backside for nine holes, he could have let you play through. Yeah. He could have said, actually, you know what, I want to take my time. I don't want to be in a rush. I don't want to feel like this guy's behind me. I don't want to feel like I'm holding him up. I don't want this guy to be frustrated with me. I just let yeah. play through. I don't need to worry about it. Another thumbs up. Yeah. Thumbs up is out again. I haven't <laughs> had one yet. So clearly nothing that I'm saying is noteworthy. But yeah, I, just, I, I think there's, I, I wouldn't feel too guilty for feeling frustrated with him in that instance. But I also get that, you know, people are doing this stuff to enjoy themselves. And, you know, it's, that's fine. But just be a bit considerate of other people that are around you. And you see, I think there's there's an there's a there's a paradox here, and there's an interesting balance that needs to be struck between, you know, again, it's it's an, an experience to play at Mayakoba. Mm. You know, it costs quite a lot to play there, and you could argue that, you know, again, he's just getting the most out of his day and and enjoying it. And it's, but on the other side, like you know, you because it's that more kind of upmarket kind of the price point and the exclusivity of playing there or whatever, you might reasonably expect the likes of Mayakoba to to actually be quite hot on pace of play and, you know, to if they're really mindful about the customer experience. So I just find it an interesting debate, if you like, between like, you know, giving the customer what they want and just a relaxed, you know, mm. sort of just do what you want sort of thing versus do you need to... You know, so for instance, I, I I think if if I if I give another comparison is when I played in Dubai a few times. Like, so we would go out there fairly regularly. Kim grew up out there. Like, you know, her parents lived out there for a long time. And I remember this one occasion when I played at the Montgomery in Dubai, no, and Kim's cousin and I had a voucher to put like one of these kind of like, you know, two for one green fee or whatever kind of thing, mm. which really helped bring the cost down. But when, when we turned up there and I presented my, like my newspaper cutout or whatever, like, you know, you could. <laughs> the sun holidays <laughs> thing that you did yeah, like, for a fiver. <laughs> you, you could just tell that the, 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 the lady at reception kind of was a, if, I just didn't feel like that that custom was valued in the same way it was by She was offended by you, wasn't she? That's yeah. what it was. Yeah. Yeah. She's these like, cheap we don't... skates coming in here. Oh, not one of these again. <laughs> you know, but but they very much were the sort of place where they were trying to it felt like fill the tea, tea sheet, mm. pump you through a sausage factory. You know, so it's a balancing act. But anyway, moving off of that, I, I wanted to share about my experience when so on that same trip hopped across to Florida for a couple of days because my sister-in-law lives there and my my niece who's now four is there and my nephew who's about eight months old and that was a beautiful experience it was lovely I met him for the first time you know I openly shared with with Kim at the time that you know it was it was quite triggering actually in a way for me to see him JT when he is around the same age that Innes would have been but that feeling soon subsided and that feeling of like you know it, it again showed me just how much you know I, I, I'd 
want to try again for children and, and be a dad and enjoy being around them. But we, you know, as if I didn't love my sister-in-law, Yvette, enough already, but on the, so we went there on master's weekend, right? Mm. And so I was managing, doing my family duties, just squeezing in, watching a little bit of the masters yeah. as well. And on the Sunday, she arranged for us to go to a place called Popstroke, which is a Tiger Woods owned venture, which is like, there's quite a number of them in Florida. But it's not crazy golf. It's like mini golf, but like serious mini golf. Is that what yeah. it is? Yeah, yeah. I've seen that on Instagram. Yeah. It looks really cool. The quality of it is really, really good. So I did put it on Instagram. So did you take your own putter? <laughs> I you love did, that you, you asked me that question. Did. No, I, did, I didn't. You but didn't. There were so many things that I, I loved. <laughs> I would have done. I definitely would have done. I know you would. There was a guy <laughs> that clearly had taken his own tailor made putter with him. <laughs> and I just looked at that guy and I was just like, imagine hey. with a long one. He's just sliding on the long one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but um, I just, I mean, I love that because, like, in the past, Kim has said to me, like, Chris, you take your you take your mini golf way too seriously. Like I'm lining up the putt. I'm probably doing like sort of like <laughs> the Camilo Vijegas thing where he's lying down on the floor looking at the <laughs> thing in the press up position, looking at the line of the putt. Exactly, <laughs> just like walking the line of the putt. In, in all, I mean, in all seriousness, there were a few moments where my niece Chloe, which she, she loved it. It was amazing to see. Like it gave me hope that she's the next golfer to come out of the family, right? So yeah, yeah, she, yeah. She would start every hole and she would putt up, and then I would follow her. And I like remember I'd like nestled this one up next to the hole, and I was I've got a birdie putt here, and she was she was going to pick the ball up every time. I was like, whoa, no, whoa, whoa, what are you doing? I'm like whoa, <laughs> <laughs> I've got this other gross birdie here. Don't touch my ball. <laughs> <laughs> so, again i just again you know just to let you watch yourself there chris you know just don't think take things to be serious but, but i think they that that place have got it right in terms of you know they had a perfect balance of things for kids things for the family you know there were yeah just different demographics all sorts of people there and and it's just it was really impressive what they've achieved one of the the so a couple of the brilliant quotes from that from that particular day or even that weekend. So mm. both of which were by my darling wife Kim. So she, she the, so when we had finished playing and we we went up and had some food there and the Masters is on TV and I'm in my element, obviously, right? Mm, mm. And she asks, and I know my wife very well, and she said, "So when uh, when does the Masters finish then?" And I'm thinking, I said to her, "It's like." This is your way of ask. This is your way of saying, "I'm finished with what." Do we have to? How much longer do we have to watch this for? You know, because you've been watching it for the last three or four days. But I loved her the way in which she framed the question, made it sound like genuine curiosity. You know, so. <laughs> but then also, Kim said she said to me, she was like, "Don't you think these pros get a bit tired of playing the same course all the time?" Like. Don't, don't you think like the you know they'd be like nah I've played Augusta loads of no, times not so fancy anymore yeah, completed it, it completed it mate I'm actually going <laughs> to Skegness for the weekend to try at a different place instead <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, just, I just laughed and I said I, I'm pretty sure no professional golfer in history Kim has ever said they've been given the you know they 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 get the invite in that sort of like that 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 lovely envelope from fred what's his name who's the head of yeah, master yeah, you know, yeah, that, yeah. And, and they open it up they're like dear fred i'm sorry to tell you but i'm actually going to decline your invitation can't, can't make play, it. i've can't played make augusta it. so many times i'm just a bit bored of it now so <laughs> but no i don't know but it, anyway so yeah that was that and then just had a trip to ireland as well mm. playing with my our friend, my good friend, mm -hmm. Andy Thomas. And his dad, right? Him, That's right, yeah. It, me, him, and his dad, and played some incredibly good golf courses in, in, in Ireland. And and again, what so so you know, one of the key takeaways I had from that was so we played over the three days, we played Port Marnock, Baltray, 
and the island. And all three are, in, you know, incredibly good golf courses. But uh, because we were playing with members in each place, we were able to get the green fee, like uh, a visitor's rate, yeah. and, and yeah, that's- a fraction of the price that it would have been for if you were a, you know, a, a paying tourist. Fully, fl- fully fledged guest. Yeah, yeah. And that these places are, golf in Ireland and those courses especially, are big on, on, you know, they attract a lot of American tourists, for example. But the highlight of my weekend in terms of golf course was a place called Corbulus, which is a um, public course, which is a Lynx course, which costs 25 euros for the green fee. And the place is, it's just magical. Like it, it's the way that they've, it was quirky. It demanded respect off the tee. You couldn't just go spraying the ball anywhere. It was like it required real precision. And, and it, there was a modesty about the place yeah, yeah, that yeah. I really liked. So, but anyway, the, 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 the thing I was going to share with you was on the last day at the island, again, Lynx course, the wind is blowing hard, like harder than it was at Mayakoba. <laughs> the conditions were wild. It was cold. The golf was, it was tough. I was struggling off the tee. My driver wasn't really working. And I just had a few, you know, I, I shared in in a recent episode that I've recently come off my antidepressants and that certainly helped me to feel things again and (laughs) feel stuff, right? But actually it's also the more intense and, you know, the the lower feelings and maybe some of the more negative feelings are, they're even more intense. Mm -hmm. And there were a few things that were really just building up on me in in anticipation of that, you know, before that trip, you know, I'd had let's just say kind of a, and I've shared this with you and I, and I get, let's just say a very close family member say to me that, that it said a few things to me about, you know, how I was handling my emotions and that I'm too mm. sensitive and too emotional as a person and kind of pouring a little bit of scorn on sort of the, the podcast and, 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 and what this could become and things. And, and that was, effect, that kind of affected me. And I also had this other thing where, I was out there. I, I do this thing where I compare myself to other golfers. Like Andy and his dad are very good. They're single figure handicappers. I felt like I had to perform. Like I was, I was at these great courses. I couldn't embarrass myself in front of these people. But then I was also missing Innis, and I was thinking of Innis as well. Mm-hmm. And I just, I had this moment where I just perfect storm type. Yeah. yeah, I just had a cry on the golf course, and Andy got close to. A, you know, he, he, he approached me on the on the fairway, and I don't think he realised what was happening. I just said to him, "Andy, I'm I'm not doing okay right now. I'm not I'm not feeling okay." You know, he's like, "It's all right, mate. I mean, it's hard out here. We're all having a tough time." I was like, "Sort the golf. It's gone nothing." <laughs> well, not that upset. About. I'm upset about the golf, but not that upset about the golf. <laughs> exactly. You know, and it's like I just miss my son. You know, it just got it got the better of me, but. You know, I think that trip was a, a valuable lesson, I think, in in just, again, not expecting too much of myself yeah, on yeah, the golf yeah. course and also not expecting too much of myself on this grief journey either. That's it. It's, it is, um, you know, as we were saying earlier, there are ups and downs to it all. And sometimes those downs can get a bit much for you. And, you know, that's when you need pals around you and your wife around you and all that kind of stuff to be able to just let you know that it will be all right. Uh, th- those moments of when you feel shit are not permanent moments. I think, like I, I think you've obviously talked about your depression in the past, mm. uh, which is obviously uh, which is why I'm assuming you were on the antidepressants in the in the first place to help to deal with those bouts of depression. And I, I think we all have the ability to find ourselves in that. It's, it's when it starts to become constant. It's when you need to start to worry. But those times where you are feeling a bit, you know. When things do feel like they're getting on top of you, it's all right to feel like that. I think it's the important thing. It's, it's important to, to actually feel like that. If it starts to become constant, then that's where you need to start thinking, well, actually, maybe I do need to think about medication or, you know, getting some professional yeah. help and all that kind of stuff as well. So, Yeah, well, I think, you know, as it happens, and, you know, I, I feel it important to, to actually share this because, you know, and, and you do know this, but the listener won't necessarily, and, and you know, part of, Again, part of the, a part of this podcast, part of Golf Yourself Healthy, is about just being open and honest, and I'm giving hope and inspiration to others. And for for what it's worth, I think mm-hmm. I first started taking those antidepressants around about five years ago, which coincided with a a very dark time in my life. I developed a very 
unhealthy relationship with alcohol, for example. And yeah, 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 okay. when I went to the doctor and basically told her everything that was going on, that was when she prescribed antidepressants and beta blockers as well to slow my heart okay. rate down. So I was having like panic attacks and things like that. So I don't take that now or I haven't taken that for a long time, but the antidepressants definitely help. They kind of, they leveled me out, they leveled out my mood uh, and got me back on my feet. And I've, I've been sober ever since then, you know, and that's been a, a huge, huge thing for me. But me taking antidepressants then was only after probably a lot of resistance in the lead up to that. Because denial, I suppose, more than anything else, denial that you've, you've potentially got a bit of an issue with the drink and all of that kind of stuff as well, isn't it? It's only when you Completely. start Completely. facing into it, you know, I mean, it's it's a difficult situation to be in, isn't it, really? Uh, but I suppose that on the positive side, right, you've, you've felt that um, you're in a position now where you can move on from the antidepressants. And I'd like, you know, I, I imagine, and I don't know, because you might have a bottle of something underneath the screen or something like that that I can't see, but I imagine you haven't had the inclinations to go back to drink to solve the issues because they're not going to stop going to solve anything. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's a numbing agent is what alcohol is. And that's affected what the antidepressants do, but at least you don't get liver disease and issues with your kidneys and all that kind of stuff for the antidepressants. Mm. No, that that's dead right. And, and no, I, I haven't had the inclination and actually, you know, it's so, I said this to someone earlier today, in fact, actually, that with the that journey of kind of recovering redemption that I've been on over the last five years with getting sober, you know, that, that was a big thing for me to overcome. And then losing Innes last year was mm-hmm. the hardest, that, that, that trumped it, you know, and mm-hmm. so I've not felt the need to, you know, because, yeah drink on that and uh i'm glad that i i haven't you know but mm. but anyway i think you know i share all this stuff just to because i'm sure it's relatable to someone out there and i guess really for you ben like i don't think we've talked in too much detail about reflecting on the podcast so far what has stood out to you the most what things are you what are you getting out of it so on a selfish level it took me quite a long time to listen back to our episode and I think we talked about this before like I have the stuff that I've been through with what we talked about in that podcast happened so long ago now that I was a bit concerned that the conversation we would have had would have on my side felt rehearsed because there are things that I've I've vocalized before to many different people in many different ways so it did take me quite a long while because I was a bit nervous to listen to it back and think you just sound like a bit of a prick and maybe I did I don't know but when I did, when I did listen back to it, I felt I felt it came across quite well, and I felt our conversation was was a good conversation to have. Certainly, was quite cathartic for me as well. Because despite the fact I have talked about that stuff before, I don't think it hurts me to revisit things at times. Mm. It just helps me to kind of process the stuff and grow. And this is what I was talking about with the other podcasts. I've I've, been, I've enjoyed them all. I think it's been. Really interesting. I've, I've really enjoyed the one with Alex last um, last week. The he, I, he obviously sounds like a really interesting guy, but he his and he's also clearly a very positive guy in his outlook on life. And you know, he I mean, he's found himself in a pretty good spot, hasn't he? He's an airline pilot and a, a gets to play all of these golf clubs all around uh, golf courses around the world, which is pretty a pretty envious position for him to him to be in right you know we would all like that opportunity but his whole attitude towards how his how he approaches his golf and he is obviously a good guy i think he put, said he played off five right so he's obviously a decent golfer and he's competent getting around anywhere he does play but actually just the, it was obvious that he was just he just loved being in the environment not it wasn't even so much about his golf it is the impression i got when he plays it's about the place that he's at and the environment he's in and the people he's with you know, the way the courses are built and all that kind of stuff. That's what he gets a kick out of. And I thought that was a really cool thing because I try and do that. Like I, I, I sometimes find myself getting a bit too invested in the golf side of it, but I often, I will often now at some point, there's a, there's, you played it, the 13th hole of my golf course is my favorite one. It's the long par five, I mean, 12 stories. He played the 10th, which is the sh- relatively short par four. And then there's a par three. The 11th and then it's a long par five which is a slight dog leg left 
and the green is on like a bit of a plateau at the end with nothing around it. And when I play it in the evenings, the sun sets behind the green. And every time I play that hole, when I'm walking that fairway or walking to the rough or the um, either side or whatever, when I'm walking that hole, I, I was, as I said before, usually I listen to a podcast or something like that when I'm playing. I take my headphones out when I walk down there and just sort of try and absorb the, uh, you know, the, the, the atmosphere and, and the, the surroundings, you know, listen to the birds and all of that kind of stuff. Right? And that feels to me like that's what Alex does everywhere he goes. And I love the idea that, his, you know, his course ratings are about the experience of the visitor, not how good the golf course is. Yes. Because that's what we all want, right? I want to be able to know, not go somewhere. That I could play the most beautiful course in the world. If I'm treated like a piece of crap there, I'm not going to enjoy it. Yeah. And the bacon sandwich is rubbish as well. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if it's soggy bacon, there's no, yeah. no butter in the, in the roll and all that kind of stuff. You've been like, this. They could, this place could have been amazing, but they're just missing a few bits. So. Yeah, completely. Yeah, I agree. You know, so that was episode six, Alex Frolish. Mm. Great outlook. Such a great outlook on, on, on golf. And I also thought the chat from, that was, had set up the, the, the golf, golf I don't suppose they had lessons, are they? The golf and society stuff was so, such a cool thing to have started. I had a brave thing to go from scratch to just be able to set that up and then have such a wide reach. Those sorts of things need a voice to be able to spread even further i think so yeah yeah well just i think in a moment we can look ahead to because i think we've got some fairly exciting things on the horizon for for golf yourself healthy Mm -hmm. for you and i so you know because you and i will be we've got a golf challenge that we set ourselves ben haven't we coming up in uh, early to mid june and that so we'll keep our powder dry on that for a moment because I wanted to introduce a segment into this. But I think I'm going to call it Cut It Out only because <laughs> the guy, so let me explain. The guys at Group Golf Therapy that I mentioned before who I've taken some inspiration from who do a similar golf podcast to this one had this segment where they, I think they called it Let Rip or Grip It and Rip It or something like that. And essentially they asked their guests they said, like, what is grinding your gears in golf? Like, is there anything that you could just take out of golf? And so I'm going to give you this, right? So it's asking someone their handicap when you've literally just met them for the first time. You want my hot, you want my hot take on that as yes. to how I feel about it. I agree. What does it matter? <laughs> uh, and I may, maybe that's, I, I, I wonder if that's because I don't play a lot competitive golf. I play a lot of social golf, so I'm there just to play golf and enjoy. And actually, I don't care who I'm playing with. I play on my own, even when I'm playing with people, unless I'm playing in a group format of some sort. Yeah. It's me against the course in that four ball anyway. So what they're shooting doesn't impact me at all. It, there's just something curious about golf. Like, you know, imagine like you tell someone that you play piano and they're like, Oh yeah, what grade did you get to? You grade five, grade eight? What level of theory? <laughs> what 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 exams did you pass? And it's like, you know you wouldn't or like when you tell someone I've just passed my driving test. Would you ask them how many attempts did you take to minus did you get? Yeah, how many minus did you get? How many majors did you get? Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I think I think I, I think it might depend on the circumstance because yes. I think if you are in a position where you're playing in a competition, you want to make sure you're not having the wool pulled pulled over your eyes when you're playing in that thing where someone says oh i'm off 20 and then they go around and shoot 78 or something like that you'd be a bit like that. but i think when you get paired up with a random like that chap we played with when we we played i, I wouldn't be able to tell you what his handicap was don't think i asked him we didn't talk about it because we were this i think the three of us were like-minded people yeah just enjoying ourselves mm-hmm. in so much as yeah we're just enjoying ourselves we don't care so much about that you know if we shoot somewhere close to our handicap it's a bit of a bore we shoot to it or even better than it is a bonus but let me i'm going to give you a story right that that i, I oh. this is what's true this is what's grinding your gears it? This... right so again like you know <laughs> I, i've got a whole back catalog of stories from the time i spent on the board at the golf club and so i looked after the the, the golf course and we had someone from I can't, it was like the national i don't know if it's a national trust or it was someone from 
basically someone who'd come and evaluated the surrounding areas in the woods of the course and there were there were parts that had been deemed as like special areas of scientific interest and there were there was a real interest by by this local body to 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 sort of promote these these rare species of like soils and and things that were like you know in 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 our in our grounds but also they gave they donated to us some tree saplings mm. to plant in an area where we had had to fell old trees because they had like some form of rot in them right so mm-hmm. you know i did my you know man of the people thing right so i i enlisted my wife and my in-laws and we went up to the golf course and went into this wooded area next to the the thirteenth hole, which at Craddock Golf Club is a par four, mm-hmm. and we were in in the woods, right, planting these trees. And I'd just been elected onto the board about a month or two previous to that. And there was this group of three older gentlemen, shall we say, frightfully posh, who came up, and clearly this one guy in particular kind of took issue with these randoms, these random people who are in the woods plant. You know, what are they doing? And and he, he he came over and and he asked I can't he asked like who are you with the, the National Trust or or, or or something like that and and I said oh no you know I'm hi I'm Chris good to meet you I was doing again you know doing my thing trying to sort of you know yeah yeah, yeah. butter people up and curry favour as being new on the board I said I'm Chris Lynch I'm one of the board 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 members here he's like he said never heard of you didn't vote for you what's your handicap. <laughs> you at the moment, mate. <laughs> I didn't realise you needed to have a handicap to plant trees in the woods. In your golf course. <laughs> what so? So it just is <laughs> systemic, and I think it, it's this weird thing that permeates through golf. And I even had a, so I, I got a flat tire on my return from the one club challenge at Cleve Hill the other day. Mm, mm. The AA guy came out to help repair my tire. So you didn't do a good job of that, by the way, because it blew up on the motorway when I was on the way home. But I was telling them, you know, we're making small talk, and what have you been up to with your day? Oh, I've been up playing golf or whatever. He's like, I'm a 15 handicap. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> I didn't need to know that. Can you just fix the tire, please? <laughs> Anyway, so next time, Ben, you're going to have to think about your cut it out. Yes, fine. Okay, I'll have a little uh, example. Little think on that. Yeah, nice. But anyway, maybe I think we should leave the listener with the exciting news, which is that Ben, myself, and Mike Harris, who some people out there may know, Mike is the creative director at Golf Monthly and was previously the editor of Golf Monthly for many, many years, I think. He, unfortunately, is part of a club of bereaved parents like Ben and I are. And I, you know, he's been quite public about that. And I I reached out to him some time ago. He's going to be guesting on this podcast in the coming weeks, in fact. But the three of us are going to be taking part in a a charity golf challenge in support of Sands, the baby loss charity. Do you want to take over from here, Ben, and let people know what we're doing when we're doing it? So Sands Stillbirth and Neonatal Death Charity, they, interestingly, when um, Brian and I lost Dylan, they were the first charity we raised money for ourselves before our fundraising efforts sort of switched to Tommy's. They basically, what they do is they support people at a local level. So they would have support groups and things like that that people would go to when they're going through that kind of bereavement. So it's a very worthy charity. I think the plan is for us to play as much golf as physically possible. I think, is it, is it that we're teeing off at 5 a.m.? Yes. And playing until the sun goes down on the 14th of June, mm. which is, and I think the sun is due to set at 9.47 that day. So it's a substantial amount of golf, I think. I don't know if my knees will be able to cope. I don't know if you can see, you probably can't see, but I have got a treadmill here. So Brian's training for a marathon at the moment. So I'm now trying to shift a few pounds myself from walking on a 10 degree incline for 45 minutes a day just to try and build up some sort of strength in my legs to carry me through that much golf. Well, I, do you know what? I was going to ask you if you were intending on setting yourself any goals in relation to doing this challenge. So it sounds like you are. I have got this 
the fact that we're doing this challenge now has given me the the impetus to get on with the same. You know, I, I want to lose a little bit of weight and, you know, work to this golf fitness plan that I've been set by by Zach Gould. Mm-hmm. So I've been struggling for the motivation with for, for, for a lot of things recently, to be honest, for, for reasons that I've given before. Mm. But I'm the sort of person who also thrives on these sorts of challenges. Like over the years, as I think you know, Ben, I've done a lot for Mind, the mental health charity and done fitness challenges. So I think this has given me the, the spark, the necessary spark to go, to go and do it. So mm. I would just say to, to the listener out there, you know, for one, obviously it's going to be a fundraiser. So if there are any spare, spare pounds or dollars or whatever that you've got kicking around it, we'll have a fundraising link at some point that we'll share. But I think we'll also try and generally, you know, I'll promote it hopefully on Golf Yourself Healthy social media channels and, you know, get sort of build, build a, a head of steam as we get towards the 14th of, of June. But aside that, I think that's me done for this this little session, Ben, was there anything else you wanted to lob in before we? No, I don't think so. Let me see if there's a, let me see if there's another inspirational quote I can give us before we go. So I had a few. Oh, here we go. This is a good one. This is a relatively, a, re- a relatively recent quote from Max Homer, PJ Tour professional who won recently. I think he won a few weeks ago. I think may have done. Can't remember. Uh, anyway, well. his quote is. There's a very small difference, but an important difference between being calm and being at peace, not going up and down, but being peaceful and accepting, standing over a shot and being okay with what happens. I think that's a fairly good thing to have to talk about from a life perspective as well. Well, offer me your take on that then. What does that quote mean to you? Maybe it's as I've gotten older and the competitiveness that I used to have, having played a lot of football, not a particularly good level, but playing a lot of football that competitiveness is abated a fair bit and actually being one with the environment I'm in and just enjoying myself and chilling out feels to me like that's the, the sort of peaceful that I'm, I'm keen for. I don't like the conflict side of things, but you know, I'm not afraid to face into conflicts and all that kind of stuff. And that helps me to be at peace with where I am. And I don't have these negative things buzzing around in my head too much which is quite nice to be in i think Bridie hates the fact that i'm like this to be honest because she's the complete opposite it really irritates her but but yeah i think that's but again i think maybe that goes back to something you said before which is around playing golf in your own hmm. I, i'm saying this because i i think you know depending on who you're playing with and their this is my experience depending on their playing standard and, and whatever i think my my ability just to really be present and be calm in golf is at its best when i'm, on when I'm doing own. it on my own yeah agreed so, i would say i would say yeah ben thanks very much for coming back and we'll do this more often i think as ever i would just ask the the gyh listeners the community members to to get in touch, social media, on email, you can find my email, email address on, on golfyourselfhealthy.com because just really would love to know what you guys are enjoying about this and, and what you'd like to see more of. I think, Ben, I'd quite like to, as we move into future episodes as well, is, for instance, in these chats that you and I are having, is bring in some, some other friends or people that we know in our golfing network who can talk about how golf is good for them mm. you know to your earlier point around that can mean so many things to different people and different stories and yeah so anyway we'll leave it there ben take care and if, on 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 a final thing it's if i'm not mistaken it's dylan's birthday tomorrow right it is yeah it is we bridie's got the day off she's running a half marathon in the morning uh, as part of her training for the edinburgh marathon which i think will help her mindset it would have been his 12th birthday tomorrow. So yeah, we, we'll do the usual thing. He's got a headstone at the same village that we got married in and there. Mum and dad did that. So we'll be going over there tomorrow after we pick Jen's stuff from school and having an evening over there. It'd be nice. Well, um, happy heavenly birthday. An opportunity to contemplate things. Thank you, mate. Yeah, you. to Dylan tomorrow. And thinking of you. And until the next time. Thanks, buddy. Embrace the rough and cherish the fairway. Indeed. Have a good one, my man. Speak to you soon. See ya. Bye. Bye.